I'm Molly. I'm the speaker. This is whiskey. Before I start this talk about art and fascism, I wanted to mention something very, very important. There were 214 people who were arrested at the January 20th protests at Trump's inauguration who are currently facing charges for felony rioting. Several of the defendants are journalists, some of them are my friends, and they're facing up to 10 years in jail. So after uh, you guys leave this speech about art and fascism that I hope has some useful ideas, I suggest you uh, Google uh, the J20 protesters because it's something very, very important and very frightening for protests that's going on now. And with that, my speech. Depending on where you stand, art and the end times may seem like a melodramatic title. After all, we're at the Lower East Side at a damn literary festival with whiskey and books. The rats still frolic, the gentrifiers still gentrify. The sky remains gray and resolute above the skyscrapers of New York. And a hundred days into the Trump presidency, some of his worst ideas have even been thwarted. The Muslim ban looks dead for now. A thousand protesters scream, New York hates you, whenever our tangerine Mussolini makes a visit. Things might seem, if you squint hard enough, in some ways unchanged. But the events of yesterday put a lie to that. The healthcare bill, which says that being a woman is a pre-existing condition, along with uh, being almost any human in almost any body. People who are affected by that will see that the changelessness is a lie. People who are immigrants will see that this air of being unchanged is a lie. And tonight, people who are French, who are staring queasily at the poll results and hoping that Macron leads Le Pen, will also know that this air of normality is a lie and the end times might seem very nigh indeed. And for others, people from countries even further along than the US in the full speed toboggan ride into authoritarianism, End times, that term might just seem like another melodramatic American way of saying the present. So maybe for my talk, beginning times is a better title. Because that's where we are too. We're in the beginning. In the early days, when the worst might still be halted. But only if everyone works as hard as they possibly can, and works with rigor and bravery and daring, and does so without eating each other alive in the process. And when I speak about everyone, I talk about artists and writers too. Now, so a bit about me. I am an artist and I'm a journalist. I got my start drawing at nightclubs for the depraved rich of New York City. Each night, I would capture the toughness and the glamour of acrobats, of dancing girls, of artists and sex workers of those men and women who were as sharp and as glittering as diamonds. And they gave me the most real education that I've ever had in politics or in life. About six years ago, I began working as a journalist. Since then, I've covered America and the Middle East. I have a rather unique niche. I write, but I also use my sketch pad the way a photojournalist might use their camera. I've drawn refugee camps in Greece, where despite the hundreds of millions of dollars flooding in to quote unquote help refugees, people sleep in tents in the snow and a half dozen people froze to death last winter. I've covered Gaza when Israel dropped shells. I've had my work looked over by the military censors at Guantanamo Bay, and I've written about the impossibly brave prisoners who blow the whistle on abuses in solitary confinement in Pennsylvania, and reported on workers in Abu Dhabi who were paid nearly nothing to build the great museums of the future. In Dubai, I once asked Trump why he paid the workers building his golf courses $200 a month, and his mouth shrank like an anus, but he said nothing, and I was yelled at. I sat in refugee camps in Greece and listened to Syrians 
who had been trapped in those tents for nine months because they lacked the right papers to cross the borders that I, with my rich world passport, crossed so easily. These Syrians who were smeared as terrorists if they fled their country's war and killed as terrorists or collateral damage if they stayed. In the sickly lead up to the American election, I drew the media spectacle of the Republican National Convention <coughs> where people who knew nothing about the larger world celebrated the coronation of Trump, a man who promised to build more walls, fill more prisons, harden more borders, to radically shrink our world and the world of everyone else as well. I started combining art and journalism because I wanted to take art out of the studio, out of the gallery, out of the rich collector's home, and to bring it into the mud and blood of the world. I wanted to prove that, even at a time when every historical event is accompanied by a million iPhone photos, visual art still has something to say. <coughs> but does it, right? After this election, like many people, I felt punched in the gut. What could I say? What could I do? What could I make? What could any of us make that would mean anything at this moment? And it wasn't just Trump. That's a misconception. This had been building for a long time. Trump's presidency is just the showiest example of a global love affair of fascism. Soft, rich boy that he might be, but he is a bloated pea in the same pod as Duterte and Erdogan, Putin and Modi and Marine Le Pen. Under pressure, countries around the world are turning inwards, turning towards strong men and looking for someone to blame. They are dropping bombs and tightening borders, launching raids and building walls. And this didn't start on November 8th, 2016. Last June, the great Kawali singer, the great Pakistani Kawali singer, Amjad Sabri was murdered in the same week that a white supremacist took the life of the humane and ethical British MP, Joe Cox. Their deaths seemed part of a great shrinking of the world into one crueler, pettier, stupider, and more violent. A world where machine gun towers seal off borders. Where kids drown in the Mediterranean. Where fanatics murder artists. And where orange donkeys trade in fear. And what, I asked myself, could art do against that? The first step is this. The first step for artists is to realize what we're up against. There is a false dichotomy that is set up by the strutting, puffing, strong men who have captured so many world governments. They divide their countries into the real people and the fake people. The fake people usually encompasses ethnic minorities, impoverished refugees, or decadent urban elites like me and you. The real people? Oh, the real people, the demagogue paints a beautiful picture. They're supposedly the decent, the humble, the pious, the patriotic, but most importantly, they are silent. They were silent until the moment our demagogue stepped onto the stage. At this point, the people, the real people, exist primarily to be the authoritarian supporters, to be his human backdrop to wave the flags behind him while he speaks at rallies, but he is their voice. You, the American people, are our last line of defense against the media's hit jobs. Trump wrote this in a mass email some months ago. The media are not the people. We're not people. And the people who didn't vote for Trump, they're not actually people either. Now to the authoritarian, artists are never real people. We are always part of that fake, impure, decadent, and disgusting elite. And that's their lie. But the bad news is, sometimes it's true. Historically, artists and power have gone together like butter and bread. We are the ones who apply gold leaf to lilies we are the court painters of Versailles. All too often artists, and I mean especially visual artists here, 
have been like Fabergé egg makers pretending to be revolutionaries. We say a lot of liberal things, sure, but we exclude the vast majority of people just by the language we use, the rooms we stand in, the ticket prices we charge for our events. We make inscrutable art clothed in an inscrutable theory and then wonder why average people don't show up. The art world is but a small sliver of a vast wide earth filled with people moved by beauty. In America, artists wonder why so many people outside the art world seem so indifferent, even so hostile to us. But many artists have long since turned their backs on them, or worse, never even considered them as equals in the first place. And what a waste this is, what a waste. Because all people want beauty, all people, regardless of class. All people want songs, all people want stories, and all people want art. When in 1912, textile workers struck in Lawrence, Massachusetts, they did not only strike for bread, they struck for bread and roses. In American prisons, uh, where I've interviewed prisoners, uh, incarcerated people uh, told me that one of the few ways to make decent money was to make cards that you could sell to your fellow inmates so that they could at least have something, something beautiful, something handmade, something creative to give to their kids on holidays. Last October, a poet from Mosul recited me verses in the barbed wire ringed misery of a refugee camp on the Greek island of Samos. And in Domi's refugee camp in northern Iraq, one way Syrian refugees earn a living is by painting murals on the walls of their neighbor's shacks. Art is necessary, art is vital, and art is crucial. It is not an expensive bauble on a shelf. It is fresh bread and cool water. It is the substance of daily life. And that, that is what we need to remember as artists and countries sliding towards fascism. For art to mean anything under authoritarians, and whether these authoritarians are governments or whether they're merely men with guns, art cannot spend all its time playing into their greatest trope. Artists cannot ensconce themselves in wealthy or even liberal enclaves. They cannot cede public space to the bigoted, to the craven, to the idiotic. Art must go out into the streets. It must speak to all classes of people in all sorts of communities. It must break out of the art world because the world is too big and art is too ambitious for the art world to contain it. Art cannot keep being a mere status marker or a mere luxury object. Bloated strongmen want to prove, want to say that artists are an irrelevant elite. It's up to us to prove them wrong. Working class artists should be proud and gatekeepers must champion working class artists, writers, and musicians. And we all must make art in ways and spaces and languages accessible to working class people. Because art is for everyone. Our enemy wants to lock us into a box, and I will be damned if we jump inside willingly. Art must be braver. Art must dare more. Art must be both a refuge and a weapon. One of the most amazing artists I know is a woman named Tatiana Fazlilizade, who is behind a project called Stop Telling Women to Smile. Uh, she's a street artist who works in New York. Uh, she's known around the world for a series of posters against street harassment. She interviews women about the fucked up shit men say to them every day on the street. Then she paints their portraits and she writes underneath the portrait the message that the women want to give to those men. For instance, my name is a baby or stop telling women to smile. And then she pastes the portraits on the walls of the neighborhoods where those women were harassed. Well, after the election, Tatiana went back to her hometown, which is in Oklahoma. And obviously Oklahoma went, you know, big time red state, right? So she painted the wall of an entire building with portraits of her friends, of beautiful black Persian and Latina men and women. And over them she wrote, America is black, it is native, it wears a hijab, it is a Spanish-speaking tongue, it is a migrant, it is a woman. It is here, has been here, and it's not going anywhere. 
The men and women who Tatiana painted stare right out of that wall. Their eyes pierce bigots. They see through them right on their own turf. And as for the people from the communities targeted by Trump, what Tatiana made was a powerful gesture of solidarity. I see you, that mural says, and I have your back. Now some of the best art is threatening art, but art threatens no one as long as it's entombed in safe spaces where only those who agree with it will see it. And worse, as long as it stays there, it remains inaccessible to those isolated rebels who need it most. The city of Oklahoma took down Tatiana's mural. She didn't have a permit, though she did have building owner's permission. Tatiana's mural is a model for what art can be. Art needs to be out in the world, whispering, screaming, seducing, and mocking, instilling us with empathy, showing us that this earth is far more complicated, painful, and dazzling than we ever previously had imagined. The art shows of mine that have meant most to me have not been the ones that hung on the walls of galleries. They have been when people held my art as protest signs in the streets. Now maybe you think I'm putting too much responsibility on art. After all, I mean, these are they're dangerous times, right? A woman is facing a year in jail for laughing at Jeff Sessions. The pen is not mightier than the sword, let alone the predator drone. Our books do not stop bullets, and our paintings cannot reach through prison bars. But as disappointment and violence spread, the antidote is a generosity that art at its best can inspire. Because art is hope against cynicism, creation against entropy. To make art is an act of both love and defiance. And though I am a cynic, I believe these things are all we have. Another note. Art is vital in times of authoritarianism because demagogues attempt to use the methods of art for their own ends. In November, many people abroad looked at Trump's election and they asked, don't Americans know he's a bullshit artist? That his promises are physically or economically or politically impossible? That he will alienate the world and tank the economy? That he negates every fine truth and makes transparent every bold lie that America has ever told about itself. What is wrong with you? The rest of the world asked. What is wrong with us? Americans also asked. How could we be so irrational? What those asking this question don't realize is that demagogues do not appeal to rationality. Sure, they might deliver on a promise of a few jobs, right? You know, prison guards maybe, or some infrastructure improvements that are essentially payouts to their friends. But that's not really what it's about. They offer something much grander, something freighted with drama, with pageantry, and with myth something that sweeps people out of their atomized feelings of irrelevance and makes them part of a greater whole. Something that transforms them from merely being resentful citizens who see culture changing and who mistake the equality of others for their own disenfranchisement. Something that alchemically changes them into warriors on the side of right. Demagogues offer a story. In a chaotic world, many people want two things. They want identity, and they want daddy. They long for a leader who promises to keep them safe, fed, and emotionally validated, but to ac accomplish those things by punishing an imagined other, the foreign, impure, unreal source of all of the homeland's humiliations. Now, depending on the country, this imaginary other might be black or Kurdish, or Mexican, or gay. She might be dancing at a nightclub, doing drugs, or wearing a hijab. She may be an impoverished refugee, 
and she may be a decadent urbanite, but she is always looking down her nose at the decent and demagogue supporting majority, and she is always laughing. Of course, the silent majority doesn't exist, and neither does the impure other. These are stock figures in an authoritarian's playbook, substitutes for solutions in our complex, impure, and interwoven world. Economic justice is just the first step to beating fascists, orange-colored or otherwise. But the second step? On the page, on the walls, in the streets, we need to fight for each other, for every last one of us. I don't mean to tolerate, like one tolerates a pair of shoes that pinch. I mean to proudly say that this world belongs to all of us and that we are not going anywhere. Ethno-nationalists are escaping from neoliberalism's cracks, just like they crawled forth from the rot of 19th century empires, and they are singing the same false and bloody tunes. In art and in life, we must write better stories. And in this, we have one advantage. History is on our side. The stories that authoritarians write are ones of dichotomy. Pure, impure, citizen, immigrant, first world, third world, secular, religious, Muslim, Christian, Black, white, us, them. Borders reinforced by razor wire, hard lines delineating irreconcilable contradictions. Boundaries hammered onto the flux, the joy, the mess, and the chaos of our connected, complicated world. Their stories are simple. One people, one empire, one leader. We know who made that quote famous in German. One. To give themselves legitimacy, authoritarians love to point to a simpler past. Think of Trump's Make America Great Again, again, the past. Or of Putin's revived Russian Orthodox Empire, or of Modi's Hindu Deva chauvinism, Erdogan's neo Ottoman fetish. Marine Le Pen's glorification of French imperialism, though in just one war, that French imperialism left a million Algerians dead. Think of ISIS's tomb-like Islamic state, utterly devoid not just of minorities, secular people, and visible women, but of all the art, learning, scholarship, beauty, and culture that Islamic civilizations have gifted to the world. In their version of history, there were no religious minorities, no gay people, no uppity women. Authoritarians tell stories of a long ago golden time when men were men, women were home. All members of the populace were of the same color and creed, or else so subservient you didn't have to listen to them. And most of all, when everyone knew their place. To them, to authoritarians, the world now is depraved confusion. The past was neat, simple, clean. In pursuit of this past, they justify their radical narrowing of the present, their hammering away of difference. They justify their travel bans and their border walls, their censorship and their bombs. The thing is though, guys, their vision of the past is wrong. This world, theirs, ours, is an interconnected one, and it always has been. You know who celebrated the first White House iftar? Thomas Jefferson. And the Spanish that I barely know from the Puerto Rican half of my family is laced with Arabic, traces of the 800 years of Muslim presence on the Spanish peninsula. And it's laced with Taino, traces of the indigenous people on the island of Puerto Rico that the Spanish killed in mass. Our histories are interwoven, our DNA is intermingled, our cultures are mixed. Purity is a lie. We are and we have always been impure. And art operates best 
It comes best from those spaces of blurring, of impurity, of mixture, and of flux. Demagogues might concoct histories. They might play at storytelling. They might try their hand at the dark magic of images. But their purity fetish renders them sterile. They cannot make real art. All they get is propaganda. In February, during a trip I was lucky enough to make to Pakistan, I saw something that reminded me of how art, even at the distance of hundreds or thousands of years, has the power to cut through authoritarians' lies. The Shish Mahal in Lahore Fort is perhaps one of the most dazzling places I've ever seen. The Lahore Fort, you know, a fort, and the Shish Mahal was designed as a place for the Mughal emperor to hang out, hang out with his court, his wife, his performers. It is covered with countless mirrors, mirrors upon mirrors upon mirrors, each the size of perhaps the pad of your thumb. <coughs> And each one of them once cast the tricky, flickering light of candles and reflected the colors of dancers' costumes as they performed for the emperor. And beneath all of those hundreds of thousands of tiny mirrors are a series of small frescoes. And one of them shows a blue figure who is unmistakably a Hindu god. Now, the Mughal emperors it was a Muslim empire. And demagogues in America and demagogues in the Muslim world both want to pretend that Islam is a monolith, that it was without nuance and intolerant of diversity. But the art on that wall in front of which a Muslim emperor once relaxed shows what total bullshit those with purity fetishes spew. There was no pure past. There was no separate other. We built this world together and it is ours, even if it burns around us. Knowing this is the first step to the solidarity that is our best shot at salvation. We can remind ourselves of this truth with these artistic stowaways from a complicated past. And of course, the Shish Mahal was a palace for royalty. But with art, we can construct new and more inclusive paradises. Artists are just one small piece, of course, in what must be a global cross-class resistance to the forces of fascism. Farmers, lawyers, doctors, all more important. And yet we must sing songs, write books, and paint walls in the colors that show our complicated present. And maybe we won't win, but our art will still exist as reminders for a more open future. And maybe we will win. And to win, all of us must play our parts artists included. Thank you. So now's the time that you guys ask me questions. My God, this is so confrontational. I think it's because it's a small audience. Like, you each feel like seen and judged by me. No, ask me anything. Um, you, I know you've also done uh, some work in the comic book industry. Um, so I'm curious as to how you, because you mentioned um, art as a uh, sort, of, sort of inaccessible and comics are among the, the more accessible forms of that. So I'm, I'm curious as to if you have any uh, thoughts as to what comics can, uh, what role comics can play uh, in the end times. Oh my god, I mean, comics provide mythology for people. I mean, comics comics are amazing. I stopped doing comics myself uh, because I'm too lazy for it, to be quite frank. I realized that uh, every single page of comics is essentially nine illustrations on one page. <laughs> and, um, I don't know, my hands stopped working and I was like, you know, this is for stronger people than me. But I think that, that comics provide modern day myths. I mean, you know, I was reading a, I forget, I forget where this, this story is, so it might be apocryphal, but it, maybe it's truthy, so don't judge me if it's wrong. But um, I was reading something about uh, Snowden leaks, and Greenwald, um, when he met Snowden in Hong Kong, was asking, like, why are you doing this? This is going to destroy your life. Why did, why did you do this? 
And Snowden's like, oh, uh, patriotism, freedom, blah, blah, blah. And Greenwald's like, who, you know, who destroys their life for that? And then Snowden said, well, you know in a video game, like when there's like one guy and then there's the big boss and you can like fight him and take it all down and like the castle crumbles and stuff? And Greenwald was like, oh, that's, that's just nerdy enough to be true. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> so um, I think that comics are an incredibly powerful means for telling story and also for shaping a sort of collective mythology. And um, when people do comics well, it is a thing of beauty. I, I grew up on a Sandman myself. I, uh, my, the first time I saw it, I must have been like seven. There was a goth girl at camp who showed me a comic book and it had the scene where like hell is French kissing Lucifer and her face is half missing. And I was like, that's crazy cool. Uh, I, you know, I love, I love Warren Ellis. I also love people like Marjean Sartrapi. And uh, it's super amazing that ta Coates is doing Black Panther right now. And God, I mean, comics, comics are, can be like the most beautiful mythology of rebellion for the end times so in that respect. things in New York City that need covering. I mean, this is a city, what is it, like 30% of people are foreign born in New York. And uh, stories about immigration, stories about people who are going to like their ice check-ins and just getting yanked, you know, and their, their families don't know where they are for weeks. Uh, stories about uh, police violence, uh, the incredible investigative work that's been done about people like Daniel Pintaglio, the man who murdered Eric Garner, um, revealing that he like was getting He's, he makes over $100,000 a year, and he's been getting he get bonuses um, ever since uh, he, he murdered Garner. I mean, that sort of investigative work is incredibly crucial and important, and I don't think it's like part of some bubble. And also, I mean, to be honest, I reject the idea that um, New York is of itself a bubble. I, I will refer, if I was going to talk about a bubble, I might talk about like white walled galleries in Chelsea and, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I mean, New York is an incredibly diverse city with the tons and tons of working class people, tons of poor people. And it's not a city that you're unreal for coming from. My, my, my dad um, grew up in New York, you know, he's a Puerto Rican immigrant. My mom is from New York. You know, my, my, whole, my whole family is from here from generations. And I don't think that they're like magically phony people because there's like some galleries in Chelsea showing crumpled up styrofoam. I don't think it catches. <laughs> so I think that just focus on stories that you know, aren't being told and focus on the injustices here. And I mean, since you live here, you probably know here the best and there's so much very, very important stuff that needs covering. I had an interesting experience when I went, had to go to North Carolina for my cousin's wedding during the election time and me and my cousin, well, uh, well on our cars we had Bernie Sanders stickers. So being in North Carolina, it was, it was just fantastic with having to deal with all the Trump supporting and it, it made me realize like how do we like you were, talk, you were talking about how we like reach out outside of this bubble that we live in I, I was just thinking like how how like it's it just felt like a like a Sisyphean task trying to like e even get a point in edgewise with like the average Trump supporter pretty much I feel you. So I think there's an important thing to realize. What percentage of America voted for Trump? It's not 50%, right? 24% of America voted for Trump. Do you know who most Americans voted for? They voted for no one. So I think it's actually more fruitful if you were trying to talk about in terms of activism, to focus on the half of the country that doesn't vote and that feels that no politician represents them adequately enough to vote. And I mean, I'm a Bernie bro, what can I say? You know, I, I think Bernie could have done that. But I think that reaching out to those people is much better than uh, trying to convince some racists that, um, I don't know, I had a conversation with a Trump supporter during the Republican National Convention who insisted um, that when I was in Istanbul, which is a city I you know, visited many, many, many times, like over a dozen, in the last year and a half, he insisted that I would have to wear a burqa in Istanbul. 
And when I told him this wasn't true, uh, he referred me to a movie about Afghanistan, and when I told him that those were different countries, he <laughs> sort of like threw his arms up. So I mean, I, I do blame like, you know, education in some ways, but also, I mean, like just the, the privilege of allowing yourself to accumulate so much ignorance. And I, I mean, I also, I also interviewed this, this cop who told me that he was voting for Trump because since Black Lives Matter, people had been giving him bad looks and Trump would stop that. Which, I mean, I should send a chill down anyone's spine, right? I don't know how you, how you deal with that. It's not economic anxiety, certainly. So I, I would suggest reaching out to people who um, feel utterly disenfranchised because I, I, don't, I don't really love arguing with people who um, would, I guess, like deny my, admire my friends uh, basic humanity. So a lot of your work is visual reportage, right? You do a lot of portraits of prisoners and refugees and whatnot, but in those pieces, you also do these wonderful, almost caricature-esque images of guards and of, you know, the, the figures of authority, right? And as a segue to your, uh, the, the, the answer to your last question, not necessarily within your work, but I guess, you know, that's kind of part of it. What role should art take, or what, what responsibility do artists have in confronting those intractable individuals, you know, those people that are never going to be convinced, as opposed to the undecided? Well, I mean, I think artists, you know, we're, we're people. We all, have a we all have different ways of viewing the world, and some people might um, like to do, you know, like gorgeous, compassionate, psychological portraits of those people, and some people, like me, I just draw them as like bloated tangerines. I don't know. I think we all have our own ways. Um, I think artists' responsibility just as humans, because um, I don't believe we're like special, like food food classes of people who, you know, have like extra responsibilities because we're better than other people, but just responsibilities as humans is to um, be honest, be skeptical, and um, to look at things clearly and speak from a place of um, truth and empathy and justice. And I think that there are myriad ways to do that with your art. Um, maybe me drawing bloated tangerines being one of them. But I think that if you have those those principles, that, that those are good guiding ones. Oh man, that's a complicated question. So I, I do art in um, a variety of different contexts. Like something like this goes next to an article that is a true journalistic article. And so um, when I would do a piece like that, I would like make sure everyone's um, you know uniform is accurate and they're standing in the right place. And um, like I wouldn't draw like twenty guards when there are two guards because that that would be a lie because it's in the context of something where people are expecting to get something factual. Um, I did that in Guantanamo. Whereas um, I have had other pictures um, where I, uh, yeah, draw Trump as a giant uh, bloated orange, and like people, people know that it's not, you know, that he that he doesn't really like. He actually has legs, and like, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I trust my audience. And then there's stuff that's kind of in between. Um, with a lot of my Guantanamo pieces, there was a really strict censorship at Guantanamo. You weren't allowed to draw anyone's faces, and. I thought if I just drew everyone from the back, it's kind of a lie, right? Because that's hiding that there's censorship. So instead, I just gave these like, sort of like smileys, I guess, but like with blank expression, because I wanted to say like there is censorship and that's here, and I wanted to make that really, really visually apparent. And so that was my way of getting um, a deeper truth about the censorship there, even when I couldn't get like the truth of people's facial features. Um, I think it's you know a balance that everyone uh, has to draw for themselves, and it depends a lot on the context. Um, I do think, though, I, I very strongly believe that if you're writing about uh, cultures or worlds that are not your own, um, it's really incumbent on you to like do a lot of research so you don't just view bullshit because it's embarrassing. I mean, there's really nothing, nothing worse than like artists that go into a community they know nothing about and, um, I don't know, just kind of like do a bunch of stereotypes that sucks. It's stupid and it's embarrassing for them, mostly. Um, but I think that in terms of um, in terms of truth, it's always a complicated thing. Like I did these these are drawings of Rukka that um, a collaborator of mine uh, sent me photos, and I trust everyone knows that in Rukka they have colors and it's not just yellow everywhere. So you know it's not a, it's not a one to one. 
but that's sort of artistic license that I could take that perhaps a, a journalist wouldn't be allowed, a photojournalist wouldn't be allowed to do. <clears throat> I think you referred to the makers of the prodigy eggs and patterns, so mm -hmm. those artists who decorated the Sally portrait, I uh, And uh, I was just curious whether you'd find any artists who are kept differently in the great museums of the world, perhaps uh, also the Delius and uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the, the soulmates. Um, uh, I was thinking of Gloria. My man, yeah. Joe's yeah, uh, painting when executed for her uh, regarding the pain of others. Uh, are there such examples? It doesn't have to be images, say, Shakespeare's plays, or that they're not um, allowed to be as rebellious as they actually are. Do you agree with that? I definitely agree. And, you know, I also I don't want to bash Papaché egg makers. And, um, <laughs> Painters of you know gilded cherubs. I actually think that they're incredibly, incredibly beautiful things done by incredibly um, skilled and talented people. I just, I just don't like if people like that in front and say that they were Bolsheviks or something. You know, it's a bit silly. Um, but in terms of the who I love of the classical art world, my God, I, I mean, to lose the track, obviously Goya. That was quite a student of you. I'm currently on a binge, a binge looking through of uh, the disasters of war and Los Caprichos. Um, I also, I mean, I love early stage Picasso. I, I looked at him a lot. Uh, Diego Rivera. I mean, I think there's something in me where I just love those, um, those sort of like uber macho modernist painters that were like the entire world is fit for me and I see no boundaries. I'm fucking Pablo Picasso. I can draw circus performers and I can draw like minotaur porn and I can also paint the walls of UNESCO and I can invent cubism and I can do like fucking ceramics and no one's gonna tell me no. No one's gonna say like, do you, Pablo? What do you do? Like, do you I mean, I see you're like doing pornographic pictures of minotaurs over here, but then in Guernica, you have to balance it. You know, it's like fucking lame. I, I, I love, I love the entitlement that um, a lot of the modernist painters felt the entire world as theirs. And um, even if I don't necessarily love the product, I love that and I think it's incredibly fruitful. And I always kind of resent when people are like, oh, that's male gaze, that's like, you know, male artist thing, no, no, man. That is an artist thing that women were forbidden from accessing. It's not just for men, it's for, for all of us. We were just, you know, women were just kept out of it. Um, and then also, I mean, I just like, I don't know, I, I, how can you not go to like the Met and just like walk around like fucking a god and stare at it? I, sometimes I'll go to wings of that art that I don't know much about, like, you know, there's the Aboriginal wing that, and I'll just look, and my, my God, my eyes are ravished. So I have all sorts of artists and all sorts of canons that I, that I think are the coolest. Uh, we met a frontline class, and I've seen you around, very serious journalists. Um, I've, been, I've been attending the rights group since literally 18 years ago in, in, in the Soviet period. And the issue of how photographers view the subjects of their photographs has always been a deeply moral and unresolved issue. But since they're using the art as opposed to, I mean, I, in, I've never seen an artist who used to, to work like you did right across the board in the human rights group. How, how do you feel the artist varies from a photographer in terms of responsibility to a suffering subject? I'm thinking of the Vietnam photographs of Boston and gone into. I mean, I think it, it depends on the artist, but it's that, that sort of moral ambiguity is something I think about all the time. I mean. I remember the first time um, I was in uh, Shatila in uh, Lebanon, which is a Palestinian refugee camp, where there was a very famous massacre. Um, afterwards, I was with um, a young Lebanese woman who took me around, and she started, um, she, she was very upset by what she had seen there, and she started telling me about um, the Afghan girl photo uh, by Steve McCurry, and she's like, she's like, he took this photo of this girl, and what did she get? Nothing. And he got to be famous, and he got to, have all this prestige and all this money and maybe it raised awareness, maybe it didn't. Maybe the awareness didn't do anything good and only did evil things, who knows? But ultimately it was her face and she got nothing for her face. And um, I think that any journalist who has any sort of moral sense will be aware of the vampiric nature of what we do and make all sorts of justifications for it. Um, in terms of my own personal justification for stuff, um, with 
art, I can change things more. Like, I mean, I, I don't do it very often for reasons of, you know, verite, but like, I don't have to have someone's face exactly theirs. I don't have to like, have the, pier the piercing green eyes and the drawing don't necessarily have to be the piercing green eyes of the child, whereas Steve, Steve McCurry needed, he needed that girl to look like that or else he wouldn't have had that photo, right? Um, I also try to draw things that I think respect people's dignity, and that's my own personal choice. And it's also because photography can be true, can be proof, right? It can be proof of war crimes, it can be proof of all sorts of things, and drawing can't. And so, since it's not functional in that way, I might as well um, respect people's dignity. But I think the final thing also is that uh, you, you take a photo, right? You can take one, and the person can be far away. They don't have to know about it. Whereas if you draw someone from life, I literally have to like sit next to someone. And they can look over and they could be like, what the hell are you doing? Fuck, you fucking ruined my face. I've had that, you know? So there's a certain like level of collaboration there. And then just to put like, I guess my own conscience aside, I always just try to stay in touch with people who are my subjects and send them stuff. I once had a friend uh, smuggle a print into Gaza of a woman that I did and give it to her. But you know, it's, journalism is always morally fraud, especially, if you're a foreign journalist who holds a big fancy rich world passport, it's always morally fraud. I mean, to me, like, if I had some, I mean, there's so many, Trump is such a hateable man, and it's hard to choose, like, what's particularly hateable, but as someone who, you know, has been an independent contractor myself, my mom over there, you know, she's an illustrator, like, this is something like, you know, clients stiffing us is our, like, like this is just our, like, vexation. This is our, like, devil in the world. And to see, like, the president is literally, like, that jerk client that has us work really hard and then steals our money, and he's, like, president, I mean, Regardless of anything else that's so enraging, and, and Hillary Clinton did do um, an ad about it. I don't know why. Sometimes I think that there's not a lot of good investigation of just labor issues. Like maybe it's just like not sexy enough for journalists. I don't know. But I mean, to me, like that, I mean, not just stiffing people, but like really his destruction of small businesses and like his bankrupting of small business people, and I mean his ruining of people uh, because he could. I mean, to me, that's something that profoundly needs to be investigated. Hey, Fred. Did you elaborate more on your doctrine of family orders, dealing with the dignity and the respect of the people that we were experiencing there? Sure, so thank you, Fred. Um, so I, uh, in 2015, I was lucky enough to work with Doctors Without Borders in Iraq. I visited northern Iraq with them, uh, the Kurdish regional government, it's called. I visited a refugee camp called Domiz, and I was initially hired to document their maternity clinic. I mean, it's a maternity clinic, right? Like, this is the most, you know, like, intimate, you know, kind of, like, hard thing, I mean, to be a woman giving birth in a refugee camp. And um, I, I actually, I, I drew a woman uh, giving birth there, and uh, to do something like that, what we did was we spoke to the woman when she wasn't, you know, whacked out of her mind on pain from being in labor. And we kind of negotiated with her how I would be so that I wouldn't you know, be immodest. And um, also so that she wouldn't see me. And yeah, we just, we just talked to her like an equal person who you know, has say in how she's portrayed. And um, later what I ended up doing in Domiz was I spent a lot of time with families that were about to leave uh, for Europe. Uh, they were gonna get like smuggled um, over the border into Turkey and then smuggled through Turkey and then uh, take a rubber boat into uh, Greece and then walk. And I interviewed about, I guess, a dozen families, some of them with like one month old kids, uh, some of them with much older uh, family members. And with something like that, what I would do is I would just hang with people. I would just visit their place that they live, like either their tent or the little house that they had built. And I'd just sit and drink coffee and I'd take out my sketchbook and they could see what I was doing. 
Uh, there wasn't anything like you know, sneaky or creepy about it. I would write down the stuff they said to me, and I would just like sit for an hour or two and just draw the families. And I mean, I, I'm very proud of the work that I did. I think some of it was in the slideshow. And yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of it's just about like consent and transparency when you're dealing with um, people who are in messed up situations like that. Well, obviously, I have like a bajillion times more privilege than a young Syrian mother giving birth in a refugee camp in Iraq. I mean, but ultimately, I mean, I'm, I'm hired to, to document, and so I can only negotiate those things as best I can. But I don't think we would have necessarily a particularly interesting world or particularly interesting bodies of work if people only did work about people directly equivalent to them on um, a very elaborate, really, scale of privilege. So I think you, know, you just you just try the best you can. And also to be quite honest, a lot of people, a lot of women, I mean, they're not really like quiet, passive people. Like I had plenty of women that were like, don't draw me, I don't want to be drawn. And um, that was cool. So um, like there was, obviously I have all the privilege in the world. I can you know travel with like my fancy ass passport and she's you know, stuck in this refugee camp. But I never felt like she couldn't tell me to fuck off if she didn't want to. And I think that um, sometimes it's a little bit of a mistake to think that people are so like so quiet and, and passive, you know, like that. What's next? What other projects do you have on the horizon that are exciting? I'm working with an amazing Syrian journalist named Marwan Hisham on his memoir of a uh, five years of the Syrian revolution and war, two years of which he spent living under ISIS when they took over his hometown, Raqqa. I'm doing about 100 illustrations of it, and I'm writing some of it, though he's writing the vast majority of it. It's gonna be out uh, in April from uh, Random House with uh, Chris Jackson, who is the best editor in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was, um, well, even, God, even before university, and this, this is like quite, quite an aesthetic and perhaps a little bit petty reason, but when I was 17, I went to Morocco and um, I just, I loved the art. I fell in love with the architecture. I, I saved my money and took night classes in Arabic during university, though I wasn't very good at them. Um, though I'm pretty proud of my, my written and bred Arabic now. And um, I couldn't do anything with that for a long time because I was like working for a living and I, I couldn't, didn't really have a way to support that. And um, when I started doing journalism, I was like, I can actually, I can do this. I can go back to that part of the world. And um, I feel incredibly privileged for the work that I've been able to do and for um, being able to like study this incredibly beautiful language that I love so much. Um, but yeah, it was, it was something that I had perhaps wanted to do a long time before and just didn't have the means to. Well, I guess I was hanging out with a lot of journalists during Occupy and it rubbed off like a rash on me. And it's contagious. Terrible people. Uh, I don't know, man. It's like one day you have like one friend and then there's like 40 of them plugging in their laptops and drinking all the good booze and then like not even saying thank you. They're horrible. <laughs> um, so I, I was hanging out with a lot of journalists and I, I was friends with a British journalist named Lori Penny, and we did a project together where we actually uh, went to Greece, and we, uh, she wrote about the financial crisis and the sort of protest movement against it, and I, I just drew, I didn't do any writing. And seeing sort of how she worked, and I learned, I learned a lot from that, and then um, pretty much immediately after I came back, I got arrested. <laughs> and I, um, I wrote an essay about that that was very popular, and after that I got a lot of opportunities. So I'm 
a contributing editor advice, which um, has no actual money attached to it, and I sometimes feel as a title with like the sort of ceremonial bearing of like, I don't know, bearer of the peacock plume, or like exalted servant of Shane's beard, I don't know. It, it doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, so, but that, they're supposedly, I guess, my most steady, my most steady client. But actually, I'm really a freelancer, to be to be honest, and that everything I have to pitch. But I, I like it like that. That means no one can really tell me what to do, even though it is precarious. Website. Uh, my website, mollycrabapple.com. in Lebanon and um, it's like my first time anywhere like even uh, I guess a little bit um, a little bit um, bang bang I guess you would say I mean it, to give you an idea of how like pitiful I was I we, we, we drive there and there's like a street it's called Syria Street and there's a one neighborhood on one side and the other neighborhood on the other side and both neighborhoods have been shooting each other's rocket launchers um, for really like very um, inscrutable, like kind of sectarian, kind of power play, kind of revenge, and kind of just idiocy reasons. And um, so I, we, we roll up, I'm on Sirius Street, and um, there's like these bangs, and I, I like, dive behind a car, and I realize everyone's like pointing at me and laughing their asses off me. And I realize it's because they are setting off, not bombs, as I thought, naively, but fireworks to celebrate the bombing of the Iranian embassy in Beirut that had happened. Because they were really sectarian there. And uh, later I was interviewing um, this uh, guy who was a sniper in one of these like local militias, and he really like hated how I, uh, how I drew him, and he thought that I made him look old and not strong-jawed, and he was very, very angry at me, and he was joking about kidnapping me. But I think it was just a joke. He wasn't actually a kidnapper. He was just, he was just like a dude who knew, uh, who knew, um, who knew uh, how easy a Western journalist are to scare, and that's what that was. <laughs> But uh, he, he was like, he said my ransom would be really low and I got pissed and that's how I ended that. <laughs> I mean, I know like artists aren't the biggest earners, but it was kind of insulting. <laughs> so does anyone else have any questions or shall we end on this, this note? Thank you guys.